Welcome back to the Hardware Unbox News Corner for another roundup of this week's most interesting news topics. I think many of us here are waiting for next week, which is set to be a big one for news with both the NVIDIA GeForce and Intel Tiger Lake launch events happening very close to each other, but there's still some cool topics to work through today, so let's get into it. First up is some official news out of NVIDIA on their next generation GeForce cooling design and power connector they'll be using for upcoming products. This one came as a bit of a surprise. We weren't expecting NVIDIA to confirm anything about their new GPUs until the official reveal next week, but yeah, here we are with a few teasers to tide us over until that event. All of this information comes from a video published to the official NVIDIA GeForce channel titled The Remarkable Art and Science of Modern Graphics Card Design. It's an 8 minute video that goes through a bunch of information on how GPU coolers and all that sort of thing are designed. If you're interested in learning about that, I suggest you check out the full video which is linked in the description below. However, for this roundup we'll be focusing on, I guess, the new information that was shown. While NVIDIA didn't explicitly detail or really show what their next-gen GPU design and cooler will be, instead talking more vaguely about design principles and improvements, there were a few renders throughout the video that give us a pretty good idea. This one, for example, shows an airflow simulation for their next-gen cooler, appearing to confirm the leaked designs we've been seeing for a while now. When the RTX 3000 designs first leaked, there was a lot of confusion into why NVIDIA were using that sort of design, so I think this diagram helps a lot to explain the thinking. The rear fan, which from the leaks is seen on the back of the board, draws air through the heatsink on the front of the card, pushing that air up and out the rear exhaust fan most people have in their case. The other fan seen on the front acts like a traditional blower to exhaust air out through the expansion slots. There's been a lot of speculation about why this sort of cooler is required, with various leaks suggesting NVIDIA's new GPUs will pack high TDPs, allegedly up to 400 watts for the highest models. That is unconfirmed at this stage, although if it were true, then of course a fancy and elaborate cooler will be warranted. And at least NVIDIA are, by the looks of it, trying an innovative approach here to cooling, rather than slapping an inadequate cooler on what could be a high TDP part. The other major reveal from NVIDIA's video is that of their 12-pin power connector, which has been rumoured for some time and even begun showing up in leaks earlier this week. The biggest thing here to note is the size. The 12-pin design is much smaller than a dual 8-pin PCIe solution that we've been using for a while now, which allows it to take up less board space, giving more space to other components or cooling. NVIDIA says the new connector is compatible with traditional 8-pin cables via an adapter, and it seems like these adapters will be distributed with new GPUs. It's also interesting to see NVIDIA mount the connector vertically. I suspect this is also to save on PCB space. In fact, in this render, you can see NVIDIA's new PCB layout with the V-shaped rear. That is set to accommodate the rear-facing fan, so with not that much PCB space available, interesting approaches like this are needed. In several leaked images, we've seen NVIDIA's 12-pin connector in the flesh, and what's immediately obvious is how it's only slightly longer than a single 8-pin PCIe connector, while being thinner. Having this connector replace two 8-pins is a big space saver, but this does come at the cost of using a non-standard connector. It'll be interesting to see how many cards outside of NVIDIA's Founders Edition will use this design. I suspect a lot of board partners will stick to the more common 8-pin connector. I'm also curious to see whether this gains any traction with future GPUs and also with power supply manufacturers outside of adapter cables, but again, we'll see all of that in the coming weeks. Also relating to new GeForce GPUs is news that both MSI and Pallet have registered a bunch of new GPU models with the Eurasian Economic Commission, or EEC. MSI have registered 29 products, while Pallet have gone with 171, but this isn't a reflection of how many GPUs each company will actually produce, as a lot of the time these are simply placeholders that allow a company to more quickly bring a product to market if necessary. MSI submissions are split into 14 V388 models, 11 V389 models, and 4 V390 models. There is no explicit mention of RTX 3000 numbers here, so it's unclear what each of these models could be, but I'm sure you can speculate away on that. Then we have Pallet, whose submissions do include numbers such as 3090, 3080, 3070, and even 3060. Lots of these have suffixes as well, and we can expect to find out what all of this means in the next few weeks. Now let's change tunes and talk about TSMC because this week the company released a whole ton of information about their upcoming process nodes and roadmaps. 
I'm not going to cover everything here. Once again, I'd recommend checking Anantex coverage if you need comprehensive analysis, but there are a few interesting tidbits in here. So first up, we have an update on TSMC's N5 node, otherwise known as 5 nanometer. TSMC has announced that N5 yields are tracking better than N7, aka 7 nanometer, at the same time in their development, which is an impressive milestone for a more dense node. TSMC expects this will lead to lower defect density for N5 compared to N7 over time. As this slide indicates, N5 is set to offer a 1.8 times increase in logic density compared to N7. This should lead to either 15% better performance at the same power, or 30% less power at the same performance. TSMC also revealed details about their upcoming 3 nanometer node, N3, which has now been given a volume manufacturing date of the second half of 2022, so about two years after N5. The stopgap between those two nodes is set to be, of course, N5P in 2021. It was also mentioned that N3 will not be using gate all around or GAA transistors, instead sticking to FinFET. GAA is expected to be the sort of next iteration of the FET design, uh, but for this design it seems that FinFET is still sufficient. TSMC's expectations for N3 versus N5 are quite similar to N5 versus N7 a 1.7 times increase to transistor density, as well as 10 to 15% more performance at the same power, or a 25 to 30% reduction in power at the same performance. Neither N5 or N3 are bringing quite the same huge improvement over their predecessors as, say, 7 nanometer versus 16 nanometer, but this steady improvement to technologies should allow TSMC to remain at the forefront of node technology while also bringing the sorts of gains needed for new chips. There were also a few more announcements like a new N12e node for low power cost optimized designs, and that TSMC expects 5 nanometer to account for around 10% of their wafer production this year. We're not expecting any desktop class products to use 5 nanometer just yet. AMD's upcoming products, for example, are still using tech from the 7 nanometer family. However, mobile SOCs should start to use 5 nanometer shortly in the next couple of months. Nvidia's first PCIe 4.0 consumer GPU is here, and it might not be what you're expecting. While everyone is busy thinking about new GeForce RTX 3000 series products with PCIe 4.0, at least that's the expectation, Nvidia has snuck a new low power mobile GPU into the market, complete with PCIe 4.0 support. That GPU is the new MX450, the latest entry into the entry level DGPU line. Specifications for this part are extremely light on at the moment, as the MX450 is yet to be used in any confirmed laptop designs. However, from past MX series GPUs, we know the MX450 is likely to be a 25 watt part or less, designed to enhance the GPU capabilities of portable laptops and offer performance beyond what is possible with an iGPU. Forget clock speeds and CUDA core counts for now, we don't even know what architecture the MX450 uses, although it is expected to be Turing. If this is true, it'd be the first MX series GPU based on Turing, as older designs such as the MX350 used Pascal. Why PCIe 4.0? Well, the likely reason is Tiger Lake, the first mobile CPU lineup to support PCIe 4.0. And yes, it is the first as AMD's Ryzen 4000 APUs only support PCIe 3.0. I don't think PCIe 4.0 is really a requirement for a part like the MX450, but it seems Nvidia are interested in leveraging the technology for their new GPU. As to how they are offering PCIe 4.0 here with a GPU that previously only supported PCIe 3.0, assuming this is a Turing GPU, well that's a bit of a mystery. The spec list does show support for GDDR5 and GDDR6 memory though. As usual for MX GPU launches, I'm sure there will be comments questioning why this sort of GPU is even necessary, given the performance Intel is set to offer with Tiger Lake, and what is already available in parts like Ryzen 4000. While there is always demand for even more powerful GPUs in some designs, and I'm sure Nvidia will continue to improve these parts to ensure they are offering a level of performance above what is possible with an iGPU. Intel has provided some additional information on their server SG1 add-in card to Anantec. The SG1 was first announced at Intel's Architecture Day, but there weren't any additional details provided. It was kind of just shown off as an implementation of their XELP GPU design. While Anantec have been able to confirm that the SG-1 is actually a board containing four DG-1 dies. Now you might be wondering, why would a server company want a card with four slow, low-power GPUs on it when they could just choose one of the many, much faster accelerator cards? And the answer is, the SG-1 isn't designed for GPU tasks. Instead, it's positioned as a media accelerator, replacing Intel's previous offerings in this space, such as the VCA2 card. 
What these cards offer is support for multiple video encoding and decoding streams simultaneously. So if you have a workload that requires lots of real-time video transcoding, then a card like the SG-1 might be a good solution. Its predecessor supported up to 44 1080p 30fps transcoding streams simultaneously, for example. So these are the sorts of numbers we're talking about, and usually this is more than other GPU or CPU solutions could provide in a similar package. Intel's XE GPU supports more advanced video transcoding capabilities than previous architectures, with up to HEVC and VP9 decoding and encoding, as well as AV1 decoding. We don't have full specs on the SG-1 and its capabilities yet, but expect a lot of simultaneous transcodes using these formats. ASUS has officially announced the ROG Swift PG259QN, their new 1080p 360Hz monitor for esports gaming. This was teased a while back in a joint announcement with NVIDIA, part of their whole Frames Win Games marketing push, but now we have all the official information ready for its release. So the PG259QN uses a 24.5 inch 1080p IPS panel capable of a 360Hz refresh rate. It also has a hardware G-Sync module as expected, although these days these modules also support regular VESA Adaptive Sync standards, so this display should also work with other GPU brands. The greater grey response time is listed as one millisecond, we'll see about that, and there's even HDR10 support, although this will be fake HDR as there's no local dimming. This monitor will be available in September, just in time for those new NVIDIA GPUs, at a price tag of $700. US We're expecting to get a review unit shortly to give you a full performance breakdown if you're interested. And finally, we have news that MSI are joining the power supply market, so we now have another massive brand expanding into offering as many types of PC components as they can. The three models on offer are in their MPG GF series, called the A650GF, A750GF and A850GF, which I'm sure you can guess the capacities of. They are 80 plus gold certified and come with a limited 10 year warranty. That said, no word on pricing or release dates, so we'll have to keep an eye out for them in the market. Lots of brands competing in that space now as well, so be sure to check out reviews before just buying based on a brand or the specifications. And that's it for this week's episode of News Corner. If you're interested in getting these sorts of videos in your inbox on a pretty much a weekly basis, then hit the subscribe button below, and it's probably a pretty good time to do so because of the GeForce and Tiger Lake events coming up next week. We probably won't have those news roundups available super quick because the events are happening at, I think, after midnight for us here in Australia. I think it's like 2 or 3 a.m., so that's not a convenient time for us to be making videos, but we'll be going through and giving all of our thoughts on those announcements and our analysis of the situation later in the day, so stay tuned for those next week. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.